Thank you for downloading my podcast, Therapist Talking Therapy. My name is Martin Weaver. Welcome to Series 2. It's January 2022, and I thought I'd begin this series attempting to answer the questions, how did you become a psychotherapist? What made you become a psychotherapist? And similar queries that I get asked along similar lines. The answers are not easy, or at least not simple, by which I mean there wasn't one particular event or one particular person that I admired that set me on the path to working as a psychotherapist. There are a number of different experiences and events in my life that to a greater or lesser extent focused me or directed me to working as a psychotherapist. A few that come to my mind are, I remember sitting in the cinema when I was eight years old watching 2001 The Space Odyssey and that gave me a greater view of the universe and of things bigger than me and it introduced me to some great music as well. My father died just after my 15th birthday and so at that time I had to reevaluate and reshape my own life. Also at that same time I was coming to terms with my own sexuality as a gay man. My father had worked as an electrical engineer and he introduced me to science and the scientific method. And so I was interested in how things work. How do we get to be as we are? But the more I got into the so-called hard sciences, I realised I was more interested in biology and how people thought, what people thought and how they behaved. My mother was brought up a Catholic and guided rather than forced us into the ideas and traditions of that religion. My father's parents were Methodists, but I never heard much from him about that. So, curiosity, the structure of the world, and how we fit into it were all awakened in me by these experiences. And I would say now that I view my work as less of a technical skill or toolbox with which to navigate the world, and much more as a philosophy of life. It was in the 1980s that these beliefs were challenged and put to the test when I was involved in the AIDS crisis, where I took the first call on the AIDS telephone helpline, created and run by us at the Terence Higgins Trust. We all do lots of things, and maybe with social media today, there will be people in the future who will be able to look back at their early life in some detail, because it will be recorded, if not in all the social media, then in photographs and videos and audio recordings. And one such recording has come back to me from 1985. I thought it would be useful to play it here, as it sheds some light on the choices I made and my journey to working as a psychotherapist. On the 15th of April, 1989, at the Hillsborough Football Stadium in Sheffield, South Yorkshire, 97 people died and some 766 people were physically injured. However, Almost exactly four years earlier, on the 11th of May 1985, at the Valley Parade Football Stadium in Bradford, West Yorkshire, the wooden roof of the main stand caught fire, killing 56 spectators and physically injuring at least 265. At this same time, in 1985, I had responded to an invitation to speak at a conference on AIDS organised by the Sandwell School of Nursing. The conference itself took place less than a month after the Valley Parade fire. Even in a time without the internet or rolling 24-hour news, I think we all felt doubly shell-shocked. As you will hear, I called the talk that I presented AIDS in Perspective. There's a lot of practical information about the things that we did and how we did them, who made up the Terence Higgins Trust, and information about HIV, or HTLV3, as it was then. However, towards the end of this presentation, I talk more about my experiences in the counselling service and the kind of calls that we got and the buddy service, the working with one-to-one people with AIDS. And in this presentation, I rolled together several different clients and presented them as two individual case studies. I think it gives you an indication here of being in a situation where I needed to respond and wanted to respond directly to people's personal situations as they unfolded in real time. That perhaps is what gave me the spur to work as a psychotherapist. I left the Terence Higgins Trust in 1986 
and went to work in public health in the NHS until the early 90s. I set up my practice in early 1997, which gave me the foundation to study for my registration with the United Kingdom Council for Psychotherapy. With great foresight, the School of Nursing recorded the conference on video. As there are no visuals, I'm playing the audio here, as I think it gives you a practical insight into my motivations and beliefs about mental health and action, as well as an indication of a sense of the emotional impact of those times, and some greater understanding of my own path, which you may well wish to compare with your own. After the presentation, I'll reflect back on what I've learned since, and how that experience informs my practice today. For inviting me up to speak here, we do do a lot of speaking all around the country, and I do find that when I go out to people like yourselves, I blithe mention the Terence Higgins Trust, and everyone sits down there and says, who? Where? So what I thought I'd do, first of all, is give a quick run-through of what we actually do, what the Trust actually is. <coughs> if you want to ask any questions that need a brief answer, then by all means, please stand up or put your hand in the air or shout out, and I'll deal with them as we go along. I've called the talk AIDS in Perspective. That's our perspective as gay men trying to deal with this new, a new disease. And I've divided the, uh, the talk into three parts. The first part about the trust and what we do and how we do it. The second part about issues that have come up, such as HTLV3 testing. And then finally, the third part, I'll discuss my own personal involvement in counselling. So, the Tony Siggins Trust. Tony Siggins himself, not the MP, died in 1982. And it was mainly through his death that people got together and decided that just enough wasn't being done. At that time, the gay men's health crisis had started in New York, and Americans were organising themselves. They had a lot more cases over there then than we did. And people who'd been to America, and people who worked and had friends over there, realised that AIDS was going to be an issue in this country very shortly. And in 1983, Gay Switchboard in London, in association with the Health Education Council, organised a seminar to increase awareness, not only in the gay community, but in the community of London in hospitals also. And as a direct result of that, people came up and said, we want to help, um, but what do we do? Now, a lot of those people that did come were doctors, um, health workers, also people who had been involved in campaign groups before. And with all their help, it was decided the best way to go about it was to form themselves into a limited company and then hopefully go for charitable status. So in 19, November 1983, the Trust became a limited company. Now to become a company, you have to have things like board of directors. And a lot of the people that wanted to help had a lot of contacts within hospitals in London. And we have three main people on our um, directors. They're the trustees of the Trust. They are legally responsible for what the Trust does. The three names that you will probably recognise are Michael Adler, the Professor of Gen Genital Urinary Medicine at Middlesex, uh, Ruth Hicks, Professor of Experimental Pathology, also at the Middlesex, and David Harvey, Consultant Paediatrician at Queen Charlotte's Hospital. Now that ensures that we have qualified medical help going into the Trust. <coughs> Excuse me. So in November 83, we have a Board of Directors. In January 84, the charity commissioners decided that our application was good enough and that we could have charitable status. Now that gives us a degree of respectability which allows our leaflets to go into hospitals and to go into pubs and clubs and people will have some belief that what we're saying is actually true or at least the best that we can get. On February the 14th, at St Valentine's Day, we opened our phone line. That's now been going about 18 months. And we've had about 2,000 calls on that. I will come back to the phone line later on and discuss what kind of calls we get. In November 84, the same year, we hosted the National AIDS Conference in London, and we had about 300 people turn up to that. Again, it was doctors, health workers, nurses, and members of the gay community all over the country. So what's the main source, or rather, what are the main aims of the Terence Higgins Trust? Why do we exist? What's our qualification for... Mrs. Horton inviting me up here. 
We have four main aims, and we state them on our information pack here. They are, one, to provide welfare, legal and counselling help and support to people with AIDS, their friends and families. To disseminate accurate information about AIDS to high-risk groups, the general public and the media. To provide health education for those at risk. And to encourage and support research into the causes and treatment of AIDS and related conditions. So those are, those are the, the things that we set ourselves to do. And what's the best way to do them? What, how are we going to, to use our time and the money that's given to us to best complete those aims? We separate ourselves into groups. It's fairly obvious and fairly easy simply because we have medical people, professional people, and lots of people who have experience in lots of different areas. So I'll quickly run through these groups. The biggest by far is the counselling group. And our main aim is services for people with AIDS. We don't like using the word victims or sufferers. In America they found out that was very negative and if you're HGLBT positive or yourself suffering from AIDS, to say and to hear everyone say you're a victim or something or sufferer isn't good. So we simply refer to them as people with AIDS and it gets over that. The counselling service is the biggest group within the trust. It runs the phone line and the buddying service. It also has support groups for HTLV3 people who are positive. We've had about four or five of those now. About 60 people in all have gone through those. They're a group of 10 to 12 people and a clinical psychologist and a nurse. And they meet for about four to five weeks on a regular basis and discuss the issues about what being positive actually means to them. That actually has spawned um, a group called Body Positive. Now, that's a social group. And they meet and have, they again discuss things and have discos and have a social support for themselves. And that's something the trust cannot do. We don't have the, the manpower to be able to provide those kind of services. So having gone through our support group, which is fairly structured, they can then go into a more relaxed group and yet still be with people who face the same problems as they do. Also, of course, we have a support group for people with AIDS. <coughs> we have two groups so far. Again, there are very small people go through that, or the groups are small and they are also run by qualified counsellors. There's no time limit on those. The people with AIDS come to them as they wish, and they again go through the difficulties of what do you do when you diagnose having AIDS, how do you tell, if, should you tell your family, your lover, and those support groups last until the person with AIDS either dies or decides he doesn't want to carry on anymore. Again, I'll return to the phone line and the buddying. Buddying is an American term, it just means somebody who goes out on a one-to-one -one basis and talk to people with AIDS. But I'll discuss those towards the end. We also have a medical scientific group. Now they're responsible for writing our leaflets. You may, I hope, have seen some of our leaflets around. And they're being rewritten, they're sort of rewritten every three or four months simply because that's the, the rate at which new material is coming through, coming through. There's a core trust group of about five or six people. They are members, volunteers of the trust, and they are constant because there's a group of about 30 people, made up of people like yourselves, who are nurses, doctors, GPs, health workers, and they turn up to meetings as often as they can. They have an input into our leaflets, and we take from them as much information as they're prepared to give. And they also, the ones who are qualified, do take over some of our support groups. Medical group also is involved in training volunteers, of course. People come to us, most people come to us, having no idea of what's involved and their experience. So medical group gives a, an hour lecture to brand new volunteers and then we have in-service training where the medical group will go along to smaller groups of people and inform them of if something new has come along. We also maintain a library. We have a professional li medical librarian and we have books, press cuttings, articles and papers. Um, it started off, as these things do, very sort of haphazard. Then our professional librarian came in and we have six or seven legal arch files jam-packed full of ordinary media stories and also medical stories from things like the BMJ. So medical group is there to back up counselling group in simple medical information and indeed the rest of the members of the trust as well. But it's also there to inform professional bodies, their own GPs and friends, what exactly is going on with AIDS, not only in the gay community of course, but with the haemophiliacs and everybody else. The social services group also has connections with the Haemophilia Society. It's a new group that started up last December and it's made up of qualified social workers. They again are there to back up counselling group. If a buddy 
is meeting his person with AIDS, and for instance, one, one person with AIDS was 35, and he went blind. His flat didn't have a telephone. And I don't know how many of you have been to the Department of Health and Social Security and tried to get things done through them. It's not the easiest thing in the world when you're fully fit. So when you're ill, it's virtually impossible. But with the help of the Social Services Department, or rather our Social Services Group, they knew in which area the person with AIDS lived and therefore who to go to to get a telephone put in. And that phone, in fact, was installed within a, a matter of weeks. So the Social Services Group cut down a lot of hard graft and so we don't waste our time going to the wrong people or the wrong department. And of course they also inform their own professional bodies as well. They are putting together a social services pack, which they intend sending out to every social service department in the country to inform them what, is, what actually is going on. We have a health education group. They identify groups that are at risk and target them for information. They are responsible for the style of our leaflets. The medical group will write it to make sure it's medically correct, as far as we know. And then the health education, or the health education department, will then put it together in a way that's readable for the particular group that it's going to. We have a, a general leaflet called AIDS for Facts. We have a leaflet targeted at gay men especially. And we are bringing out, in conjunction with other professionals, a leaflet for intravenous drug users. So each information we're giving out has to be targeted to a specific group. We have a media and public relations department. You may remember in February when gay plague kills priests hit the streets. We had the press on our backs for months after that. And it's important that we have someone who knows how to talk to the press. You will find as the antibody testing becomes more of an issue, and you will find the press looping around for people with AIDS story in your hospital, in your ward. And it's important that you in hospital now have someone who can deal with them, because you have to be fairly firm with them. We used to at the beginning, we act whenever they ask for anything. Now we tend to say, what's your name and number, we'll give you a call back and make them wait. They will put a lot of pressure on you. And it's important that nurses on wards, even hospital workers, anybody in the hospital who knows of people with AIDS, know how to deal with the press, know what to say to the press, and just, perhaps more importantly, know what not to say to them. Our instructions to volunteers is don't talk to them, because they can be very nice when they go back to their typewriters, they do, and they will twist everything simply to sell papers. A friend of mine, our press officer, did say that uh, in February, AIDS was on the front page because it sold more papers than bingo, which at the time was quite true. The last two groups that are basic ones, um, fundraising I think is fairly obvious. We have a government grant of £25,000. The first batch of £6,000 has just come in. We are hoping to get a GLC grant. That has not yet materialised. The government grant will pay for full, two full-time workers, but as we reckon we need £100,000 to keep going every year. We need the money that we get from the gay community and from personal donations. And the other group which I'm more involved with uh, immediately is the office group. I'm the only paid worker at the moment on a month-to-month -month basis with the Trust. And my job is to keep the office going. It's unfortunate that paper is important. We're trying to keep it down to as little as possible. But when we get in 30 to 35 letters a day, requests for leaflets, requests for speakers, and medical information, we must have somebody in the office to deal with that. Also to deal with phone calls, like Mrs. Horton phoning up, wanting a speaker. And basically to keep all the volunteers informed as to what's going on, otherwise the whole system breaks down. And our basic aim to help people with AIDS cannot be done. So that gives you a rough idea exactly how the trust is formulated and how we've organised ourselves. Of course, as more people come in with different ideas and with different skills, we will grow. The number of people on our computer at the moment is 256. That's a large amount. Not all are working, and a lot of them are going through training. But there's a great need and great want for people to help, and we are helping in out in, in training them and getting them out as soon as possible to do some useful work. Now, working in the Trust and working with all the information that comes through, basic issues arise at different times. There's only three issues I want to discuss this afternoon. Different ones will come up, as I say, and different ones have been, but the three main ones I'm going to discuss or ask you rather to think about. One of safe, safer sex, the HTLB3 testing, and from that I'm going to go into things like confidentiality.
which is of paramount importance to us. It's not usual in this country to openly discuss your sex life with anybody, even in, within a marriage. The issue of AIDS is going to change that to a certain degree. It's also one thing for doctors and counsellors to know within themselves and to be able to talk to each other about sexual experiences, but talking to your own patients is difficult. Because we're 99% gay run, we produce first of all an ordinary leaflet on AIDS, setting aside exactly what the real facts were. Then we produce this leaflet, which is AIDS, more facts for gay men. And it attends itself to those issues exactly. What do you do? What shouldn't you do? They're based almost on the American ideal. Not as blatant as the American ones are. We feel that if that happened, the police might get a bit upset. But in America, they have leaflets on safe sex that are quite, as I say, blatant and they leave nothing to the imagination of what exactly is going wrong. Now we know that AIDS is transmitted mainly in the blood. And we know that the easiest way is through anal intercourse. Because the anal tract being only a couple of cells thick isn't built to take a battering like it gets. Now those of you who will deal with gay men and straight people as well will have to address yourself to talking to them in specific issues. So the trust is there to provide an atmosphere for which people can discuss instances of safe sex without feeling upset or inhibited. If you think about it, sexual intercourse is the main way, main route of transmission. And there's no way you can discuss how are we going to stop the spread of the virus without addressing yourself to those issues. Now we have to say produce this leaflet and we go through simple questions like what are the risk factors? Um, how can I reduce my risk of getting the virus? Is there a test? Should I have a test? And what do you do if you're HTLV3 positive? We are thinking at the back, no research has been done on this. As far as we believe, the use of condoms may actually help. Because we know that in hepatitis B it does help. But nobody's actually filled the condom full of HTLV3 virus, <coughs> slung it round to see if it's permeable to it. We are suggesting to the gay community, and to everybody in fact, that condoms may reduce the spread of, of the actual HD3 virus. <coughs> what we're trying to do in these things is to cut down people's chances of coming into contact. We say on the front, um, under the title Remember, the more men you have sex with, the greater chance of getting AIDS. The more people you have sex with, the greater chance of getting anything. AIDS is just one thing. We also say that anal sex carries the highest risk, which because of the way of transmission, Obviously, we believe at the moment is correct. We also have two other ones. Do not donate blood or semen. Now, we have said to the gay community especially that you shouldn't donate blood for the last two to three years. Um, and I think that the papers have taken it up in some instances. You saw probably in the Sun, I think, a few months back, Prince Charles was giving blood. So obviously that message has got home to some people because the blood banks are dropping. So the, the gay community or people are at least taking a responsible attitude to it. We also say do not carry an organ donor card, and that's for the same reason, of course. Um, I know that when the seatbelt law came in, the number of kidneys uh, available for transplant went down. No one's actually said anything yet whether the number of organ donors has actually dropped as well. But obviously the number of people donating blood has changed. So that's one issue. How do you discuss that amongst yourselves and amongst people that you meet? Also, of course, if you think about it, if the main transmission route for AIDS is through blood products or anal intercourse, those of you who are dealing with people with AIDS on a, a secondary level, in a sense, with their dressings perhaps, with sheets and things, you'll know that your, your chances of coming into contact with the virus are very small. Because as, as Dr. Sharp said earlier, there's been no case yet of a health worker or a doctor developing AIDS. There have been cases of nurses seroconverting but that's simply because they've either jabbed themselves with a needle or they've got a connection um, with Africa. There's been no case yet of someone developing AIDS just through nursing a person with AIDS. So that's one issue. Another issue is that of HTLV3 testing. And here there's two basic questions that you, that you have to think about. Should we test and what's, what good is the result of it? 
And who should know the result? If we decide that we should test, for whatever reason, then who, who should have the test? Experienced doctors, perhaps, who are doing research into it, into AIDS. Partners of people who are HTLV3 positive, or partners of people who, who got AIDS. Socially responsible people, perhaps, who decide that they must know so they can limit their own sexual lives. Although, having said that, it shouldn't just be those who are positive or those whose partners are positive. Anybody who wants to restrict the spread of this virus should, should hopefully follow our safer sex guidelines. And in that way, hopefully, even those who are negative won't even come into contact with the virus. But what does the test detect? Well, Dr Sharp has told you that it basically it detects the body's reaction to the virus. There is no test yet, no simple test, for the virus itself. The virus has been grown in America. I'm not sure if it's been grown here, but it is very difficult to do so. There's no quick test to say that person has a virus and that one doesn't, even if they're both positive. There was some instance earlier on also, of course, of false positives and false negatives. Now, they are, thankfully, dying down now. They're increasingly rare. But the possibility is always there. And if you do have the test, and let's say you test four people in an ordinary STD clinic, I'm assuming that you've asked them, or they have been asked, if they want to be tested. I know a lot of hospitals do test all sorts of people for all sorts of things. But it's... <coughs> pardon me. We believe that, the trust believes, that patients ought to be asked, do you want the test? And do you want to know the result? Because a lot of people, once they've been told they are positive, link it with having AIDS, and they phone us up in a state of panic, believing they're going to die in the next six months or whatever, when all we know is that about less than 10% or so go on to develop AIDS. Now, the Department of Health and Social Security, along with the Blood Transfusion Service, will be having the HTLV3 test widespread by the end of the year. And we're going to get a lot of people, if not careful, who are positive and can't deal with it. And what are we going to do with them? What are we going to do? We have had stories of people who come in and the doctor said to them, find your test, turns out you're HTLV3 positive. Come back in three weeks' time for some more tests. Well, that's an extreme case, but it has happened. That obviously is not the, best, not the best way to deal with people. To put somebody out on the streets and tell them they're positive to what is an incurable disease is not the best way to deal with them. So the trust is there, hopefully, to inform doctors of the issues that go beyond the simple <coughs> medical side. And the social services group will be there to inform the health workers on what hopefully they ought to be telling the people who are positive. So you tell someone they're positive. Hospitals do tend to mark things, um, files, biohazard, that kind of thing. We have got instances we know of where nurses, one nurse, one student, and other people who work in catering have been sacked from their jobs simply because they're HTLV3 positive. Now, in some cases, they've had a degree of social responsibility and thought, I'm positive, I must go and tell them, because they must know. And they go along to their employer and say, look, I've had this test, I am positive. And the employer comes back the following day and says, you know, sign this resignation form. So obviously education needs to be done there. But the worst thing is, is when your doctor, whether it be a GP or an STD clinic doctor, meets a friend of yours and says, oh, by the way, do you know X is positive? And we have instances there where people have been losing business trade because people prefer not to, to be with them simply because they're positive. Now, those are issues which doctors are going to have to concern themselves with. If they do the test without asking people and they find they're positive, can they go back to that person and say, we've done this test without your permission and we found you're positive to a disease you may not get? And then if that leaks out into the papers, as it has done, if you remember again back in February with gay play kills priest, where did that information come from? And that priest, his parents came over from America not knowing anything about him other than the fact that he was a priest at a prison. So they arrived at Heathrow Airport to be confronted by photographs of their son being splashed all over the, the tabloids. Which seems to me a, a disgusting way to deal with anybody. Now we've got a good system in this country as far as STD clinics go, with their absolute 
as that which anything can be, confidentiality. But that doesn't exist and doesn't spread across to GPs. And in some instances, there are people who will decide that this sort of information can be useful, especially if somebody famous, or indeed infamous, develops saves. And the checkbook journalists don't look any further, unfortunately, than their checkbooks and their copies. So those, those are issues that we're concerned about. We managed, not on our own perhaps, but the government didn't make aid to notifiable disease. Now, if they had done, we come across this point where people believe if they go to the clinic, their name's going to be released everywhere. I think it was Harriet Harman who said that people's names and addresses should be released to the press, people who died of AIDS, even after the gay plague kills priest scandal. Now, that hasn't happened, and the government has decided not to make it a notifiable disease, even though they had... This country is the only country in the world that's brought in any kind of legislation for people with AIDS. No, all right, they say they don't expect to use that legislation except in very rare cases. But the legislation nevertheless is there and it hasn't had to be done in any other country. I think that probably speaks more about the people that made the legislation rather than AIDS itself. So those are three, three issues that um, are difficult, and they're very difficult indeed. Now, I said at the beginning, the aims of the Trust were, one well, of the main aims was to provide services for people with AIDS. <coughs> Pardon me. So I'd like to talk just a bit, 15 minutes or so, about my own personal experience. Because I joined the Trust in 1983, when we were still very small. And we were deciding, should we have a phone line? Do we need it? And on February the 14th, we managed to get an office and set the phone line up. We got about five, six calls a night. The first call was from um, two guys in London whose friend of theirs was coming home from America who got AIDS and it was his last fling and they wanted to know what to do, what precautions they should take. The calls have wavered between more specific things. Generally, like when gay plague kills priests, I didn't get any work done in the office that day because I took about 60 calls because we didn't have one line there. And they were mainly from what I call <coughs> straight men who'd had sex, gay sex, once perhaps in the last three years. And they weren't frightened about the possibility of having AIDS. They were absolutely terrified. They were going to pass it on to their wives and their kids. I had three or four break down to me on the phone. So the first thing I had to do was calm them down. Secondly, tell them the facts as we know them and that their chances of coming into contact with the virus were so minimal. They didn't worry at all. And once they'd heard that, they then had to get over the burden of do they tell their wives or not? Our trust counselling policy is non-directive. <coughs> we don't tell people how to run their lives, what they should or shouldn't do. What we do is put in front of them the facts as best we know them. And they must make up their own minds. As it happened with some of these men that phoned up, a few of them did actually tell their wives, because they phoned back later on. And uh, things had worked out a lot better. So that's an, an instance of direct result of what, what the press have done. Other calls come from people who are what we call the worried well. They perhaps haven't had sex at all, but they still think they've got the virus. Those ones we can talk to, and um, half those will believe us, half them won't. We normally refer them to a clinic. They prefer it if a person in a white coat tells them, <coughs> rather than somebody over the phone. And of course, we get the people who are HDLB3 positive. And they want to know what it means, what they should do. We can refer them, of course, to our HDLB3 support group. And many of them go through that. And then, of course, we get the people who phone up and say, I've just been diagnosed as having AIDS and I haven't been told anything about it. They're obviously more difficult. But you take it from the point of view that when everyone or when anyone is told they've got a, a terminal disease, they might not listen to everything the doctor says. So when they say, when they say to us, the doctor hasn't told me anything, it's probably because they haven't listened. It's not an easy piece of information to take in and then go on to take in what's being explained to you. So if any of you here I have in the past or will have to in the future tell someone when they got AIDS, if you can bear that in mind. I know it's difficult with uh, pressure of work and all that, but sitting someone down for half an hour or an hour does do a lot of good. And we get phone calls from people who say, my lover, my brother, my friend's got AIDS, what do I do about it? So then again, it's just simply a case of telling them about the facts, what their chances are, what risk reduction they should take. 
And there's a whole myriad of things in between. We get very few obscene calls, very few um, hoax calls, and then one or two abusive calls, which is surprising. I thought we'd get a lot more. That's one side of the counselling work. The other side is the budding side. That is split into two. There's the immediate inter a crisis intervention. Somebody can phone up and they may need help immediately or within a couple of hours. And we have a group of a few people who we can phone up and they will go out and see that person, see what needs to be done, deal with it there and then, hopefully. And that will be it. And it's a simple one-off crisis counselling. The other one which I've been more involved with is the buddying. And as I say, that's where one person goes out and meets somebody with AIDS and gives them all the help they can. The help there runs into two, two main streams. The first part is you know, kicking the DHSS to get them moving, to go to the right people, to get things done. That's a lot of legwork, but it's fairly simple. The other one is more difficult, it's the befriending and the counselling side of a person with AIDS and perhaps their lover and friends as well. And the first person that I buddied was uh, Peter. He was a 23-year-old gay man. We first heard about him because he was diagnosed with having AIDS and he had a lover who had been together about three years who promptly kicked him out and he was staying with some friends of his so we had to find him somewhere to live. He was cut off for most of his family apart from one brother who did look after him occasionally on the weekends. I knew him for about eight months, had a bit of contact with his brother. He was odd. They have found the AIDS virus in the brain. So you've got the chance or the possibility someone has changed their personality because they've been told they've got a terminal disease, which is bad enough. But a personality change can sometimes occur as well or from a medical point of view. And it is being postulated that the AIDS virus in the brain may be responsible for that. So I got quite a lot of sticks thrown at me from Paul. Now, whether that was him or the virus, I don't know. But that's the kind of thing a buddy has to put up with. Not being threatened, but certainly being verbally abused um, by people with AIDS, which is understandable. A person with 23 being told they're going to die in six months' time. They've got to vent their bitterness on their anger on somebody. And it's better they can get it out. Towards the end of his life, his mother, who was a Jehovah's Witness, if that means anything, she didn't want him at all. She, no, she didn't want any contact at all. But then, for some reason, she turned around and she took him in again. And he went back home and he stayed in hospital, close to his mother. And he died a couple of months after that. The difficulty in Paul's case, uh, Peter's case, sorry, was trying to cope with him and, and trying to inform his brother of the, uh, the real facts again. The fact that he could stay in the home and not infect either his wife or himself or his kid. A more complicated case was that of Paul. He was older than Peter, he was 35. And he was completely estranged from his family. They lived um, in Manchester, I believe. And they hadn't seen or talked to him for five or six years. They didn't know A, that he was gay, or B, that he got AIDS. They found out he was ill. Um, I think he actually written to them at one stage or phoned them up. And when um, Paul actually died, of course, the family came down. So we have a situation where the person with AIDS doesn't want his family to know that he's gay or he's got AIDS. And there's me trying to answer his mother's questions when she says, why wouldn't he talk to us? What was wrong with him? And then she asked me, well, what are you doing here? Now, I don't think, didn't think at that time it was my job to tell her anything, because that's not what I was asked to do. We were lucky in that one of, um, one of Paul's friends had actually told his, one of his brothers the full situation. So the pressure was taken off a bit from there. But you can see that there's lots of different issues to take up. I, when I first met um, Paul, which was in hospital, we talked around a few general things. When I mentioned death to him, which he backed off straight away. So I, he mentioned it again when I saw him a couple of times later. And we talked about making a will. Now most people decide that when they make a will, they won't sign it, because as soon as they sign it, that's it, they're going to die. It didn't occur to me until after, after Paul had died that he had made that conscious decision himself. Because though he was having difficulty taking food and keeping it down, after he'd made that will, scribbled out that will and given it to me, he died about two weeks after. 
And it wasn't until after that I realised he'd made a conscious decision, I believe. But enough was enough. And he'd done all he could do. So he wrote out his will. And as I say, he died two weeks later. On a, a cold note, as it were, that will had no legal liability at all. His family could have come down quite legally, sold his flat, sold his belongings, and gone back up north. And there's nothing anyone could have done about it. Thankfully, they decided, they, they read my translation of Paul's will, and they decided they, they'd abide by it. So Paul's friends got the things that he wanted them to have. But if any of you here haven't made a will at all, then I would advise you to do so. Um, especially if you've got a gay relationship or an unmarried one. The other family can come down legally and wipe off whatever you need. It's very difficult to know the outcome of the work that you're doing at any kind of job. We get letters back from people, from people we've seen, and we get phone calls back. So in that sense, that sense we have some idea that we are getting through to people. It has been noticed in the clinics in London, the number of gay men attending clinics has increased, but the incidence of gonorrhea, for instance, has actually decreased. So hopefully our publicity is having some kind of effect. Just really to bring this to a close, is to stress one point to all of you, and hopefully you'll take this point back to everybody else as well. AIDS is one of the least infectious, infectious diseases. There's no point in having isolation hospitals for people with AIDS, because they'll probably die before they get there anyway. But the chances of you coming into contact with the virus and developing AIDS, if you're not in one of the risk groups, is very minimal. And if you can take that message back to you and your friends and everybody else, back to your trade unions, back to your leaders, back to your friends, then it would have been well worth it. We get a lot of people who are really worried about catching AIDS, developing AIDS. They put barriers up between their friends and their families for no real reason at all. Intimate contacts, blood products are the main way AIDS is transmitted. And no other way as far as we know. So on that note, which is quite helpful to a lot of people, I hope you do take it back. I'll, I'll end there. Does anyone have any questions they want to ask either about the trust or the work that we do or AIDS in particular? There's a lot to take in, I know, so if you want to save them for later. Yes? Is there a contact in your A contact for? Um, not as part of the Terrence Higgins Trust. Um, but if you see me afterwards, I'll, give, I'll take your name and address and I'll be in contact with some people. There is an AIDS line starting in Manchester and there is an AIDS line starting in Nottinghamshire. Nottingham. Um, but the Terence Higgins Trust is London-based. We haven't got the manpower to go out around the country. But I have been speaking in Bristol and Bournemouth and Brighton, um, Cambridge, and places that are starting up their own information services. <coughs> Anything else? Do hospitals actually contact you to come into the hospital to speak to patients? Mm. Most of our references come from doctors from the major hospitals in London. Um, of course, not all the people with AIDS want to know us, um, or they want to know us at different stages. HTLB3 positive people have also referred to us from doctors as well, and they of course go straight into our support groups. Some people come to us off their own backs. In the early days, um, you may remember there was a man with AIDS at the BBC, it was in, in the papers, and he told us that uh, he was diagnosed with having AIDS on a Thursday afternoon, and the consultant at Charing Cross talked with him for about half an hour, and then said, come back in two weeks' time for more tests. Now that stage, which was about a year ago, the hospitals either didn't know about the trust or didn't have enough confidence in us to be able to refer people to us. And now that is changing. Um, as more information gets out, then we'll have more people referred to us. Okay. What I learned in those early days that informs my psychotherapy practice today are the following. Most people live in fear of something. Standing up for my beliefs and values is scary and exciting in equal amounts on balance. Being informed 
is better than being ignorant, mostly. People in adversity either run away or run towards their fear. I choose to run towards mine, mainly. In times of stress, it's easy to lash out. I know I did a few times, and which now, on reflection, I regret very much. It's very useful to accept a state of not knowing. My value, my self-esteem, is not dependent on my knowledge, financial resources or status, but on my ethics and how I treat others. People are doing the best they can with what they have. And finally, all things come to an end. Would I change anything? Far too many things to cover in this podcast. These experiences shaped me, but not created me. Now, at 61, I've survived skin cancer and prostate cancer, and after my HIV AIDS encounter, and maybe because of it, nothing seems very frightening anymore. I meet all sorts of people in my work, and yet facing and squaring up to HIV has been the defining moment of my life. My early development provided a basic foundation for the lived experience of those days, which then forged in me skills, ideas and concepts that I use every day in my practice that no training could ever hope to provide. So my advice to psychotherapy trainees is get involved. Put your knowledge and skills to work in practical, real-world situations. In that way, you develop the confidence self-reliance to make the best use of your knowledge and skills. Thank you for listening.